The year is 2007. You've just gotten a Wii as a gift, and with it some games. You take a look at the games you've been given. Super Mario Galaxy, Wii Sports, and a third game. A very interesting game with the title Super Paper Mario. Very curious as to what this is, since you've already played the other two games, you boot up the system and get immersed in a seemingly flat universe, taking control of a Mario made of paper. But how did this series begin, and where is it today? The Mario series covers a huge variety of genres. Platformers, sports, racing, party, educational, and role-playing games. With the recent bankruptcy of Alpha Dream, the creative geniuses behind the Mario and Luigi games, it's a good opportunity to talk about the other big Mario RPG series. My name is Taylor, and welcome to Unfolded, a Paper Mario documentary refolded. This is just a remaster of our Paper Mario documentary from last year, now with Origami King included. With that being said, let's get into the history of this gaming staple. The story starts with the game company behind the series Intelligent Systems. It was founded in December 1986 by Toru Narahiro. Initially, Narahiro was hired by Nintendo to help them port the Famicom Disk System software to the ROM cartridge system, which was later standard outside of Japan for the NES. Later on, the team would grow, and their primary task was to help fix and port Nintendo-developed games such as the original Mario Bros. and Duck Hunt, and Donkey Kong 3, to name a few. Narahiro would program his first two games and release them towards the end of the Famicom's lifetime. Those games were Famicom Wars and Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light. With the success Narahiro found, he decided to hire more people, and thus Intelligent Systems became a game-developing company. After the release of Square's critically acclaimed Super Mario RPG in 1996, the folks at Intelligent System were working on what was supposed to be a sequel to that game. The game was revealed at Space World 97, with Shigeru Miyamoto as one of the producers of the project. It was revealed in an interview with Nintendo Power at E3 that year that about 20 people worked on the game. Amongst those included writers Kumiko Takeda and Kaori Oki, with Naohiko Oyama as the art director, responsible for the game's unique paper art style. Originally, the game was called Super Mario RPG 2, but due to some legal complications with Square, the name was changed to Super Mario Adventure, then Mario Story in Japan, and Paper Mario for the rest of the world. It was originally meant to be released on Nintendo 64DD, but the latter ended up being a commercial failure, so the game released on the regular 64. Early screenshots of the game showed the title screen with the name Super Mario RPG 2. Another screenshot depicted an early version of Dry Dry Desert, the final image was a concept of Mario, Luigi, and Yoshi in their Super Mario World sprites, surrounded by a 3D paper-like environment, with the title Mario RPG 64. Considering that the image was dated March 4, 1997, it can be assumed that this was the basis for the series' paper art style. The final game released in August 11, 2000 in Japan, February 5, 2001 in North America, and October 5 in Europe and Australia that same year. Paper Mario blended the traditional turn-based combat with an explorable 3D overworld filled with platforming puzzles. As the first entry, it introduced many elements that would become staples of the series, such as badges, the partner system, and the overall battle system. Badges were items that provided new moves, buffs, or other passive effects such as restoring HP every turn. Players could buy them at badge stores, get them as rewards for completing side quests, or find them randomly in the overworld. Like in most RPGs, Mario was followed by a party of unique characters who not only helped Mario in battle, but also in the overworld. Each partner had a special ability usable in the overworld. For example, Mario could toss Koopa shells to reach items that were too far away, or Mario could have Bombette explode to destroy cracked walls. In battles, Mario would have the choice to either jump, use his hammer, an item, or a special move using Mario's star power. Mario's partners all had unique moves, and they could learn more as they leveled up. After selecting an option, the player would do a short mini-game, and the better their result, the stronger their attack. That system inspired the one used in the Mario & Luigi series. Paper Mario was a smashing success, and received great reviews. The visuals, gameplay, and music by Fire Emblem composer Yuka Tsuchiyoko were praised. However, some found the game's story too simple, and the bosses and puzzles too easy. 
Nevertheless, the game was generally a commercial and critical success, and sold around 1.37 million copies worldwide. Following the success of the first game, Intelligent Systems didn't waste time to start working on a sequel. It would eventually be unveiled to the public at the Game Developers Conference of 2003 under the title Paper Mario 2, set to release on the Nintendo GameCube. A demo of the game was available to play at E3 2004. Attendees could go through Hooktail's Castle and a Bowser bonus stage. The game would be released in Japan on July 22, 2004. The worldwide version would get the new title Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door and be released in North America on October 11th in Europe on November 12th, and in Australia on November 18th. The Thousand Year expanded upon numerous aspects of its predecessor and refined a lot. The visuals got a significant upgrade and became much more clear with very vivid colors. When it comes to exploration in the overworld, this sequel introduced paper abilities. Depicted as curses in the game, these abilities allowed Mario to change the shape of his body like paper. For example, Paper Mode changes Mario to be as thin as paper, which allows him to get through tight spaces. When standing on certain platforms, Mario can activate plane mode and fly like a paper plane. When near water, Mario could also activate boat mode, which turned him into a paper boat and allowed him to navigate on water. The game would also sometimes have the player go through the background to access certain areas. All of these new elements spiced up the overworld exploration and allowed for some interesting puzzles. The game's story, unlike the prequel, was much more serious in tone and introduced a new species of villain called the x knots in between the chapters, the players would be treated to an intermission in which they would either play as Bowser and go through a stage a la Mario Bros, or as Peach and try to escape the x Not Fortress. The game added brand new partners with new abilities such as Vivian and Flurry. The former allows Mario to hide in his shadow, and the latter can blow on certain paper elements of the background. The overworld has some items hidden in it like returning badges, the shine sprites, and the star pieces which could be exchanged for some rare badges. The battle system remains largely the same, but now the fights are set on a stage with an audience. Every time Mario attacks, the audience reacts and helps him fill his star power gauge. Sometimes the audience can help Mario by throwing useful items at him or throwing trash to hurt him. Occasionally, Luigi can be seen in the audience. Another change is that partners now have their own health points. In Paper Mario 64, the partners operated with an injured and fine system. But in the sequel, the player has to manage their partner's health, otherwise they will faint. Partners also can now only level up and learn new moves when taken to Merlin, and in exchange of three Shine Sprites. Some badges also have variants for partners. As an example, Charge P allows Mario's partner to use the move Charge and buff themselves. The game eventually encountered a really small controversy. In 2008, four years after release, Morgan Creek Productions filed a lawsuit against Nintendo claiming that they had used the song You're So Cool from the film True Romance in an ad for the game without permission. They dropped the lawsuit six days later after Nintendo informed them that the advertising agency Leo Burnett USA had licensing for the song. The Thousand Year Door was a critical success, earning favorable reviews for its story, characters, and engaging gameplay. The paper mechanics were well received, and as some reviewers like 1UP said, it's a cohesive, clever approach that turns the game's visual style into more than just a look. The music and the intermissions were also praised. According to VG Charts, the game ended up shipping over a million units worldwide. All in all, The Thousand Year Door was a successful sequel in almost every way. After seeing that The Thousand Year Door ended up being a grand success, Intelligent Systems went back to work on a third installment. However, things would be different this time around. In a May 2007 interview with Nintendo Power, series director Ryota Kawade revealed that after the development of The Thousand Year Door had finished, he wanted to do other types of games with the Paper Mario brand. One day while he was taking the train, he was thinking about the intermittent Bowser stages of the previous entry and fixed his gaze towards the other train. This gave him an idea of a side-scrolling platformer where the player would have the ability to switch between 2D and 3D. Kawade shared his ideas to producer Kensuke Tanabe and later decided to use this idea as the basis for the next entry in the Paper Mario series and thus was born Super Paper Mario. It was originally revealed on May 11th at E3 2006 and was set to release on the Nintendo GameCube. On May 30th, an October 7th, 2006 release date was announced. However, the game would then get delayed to finally release on the Wii, first in North America on April 9th, 2007, April 19th in Japan, September 14th in Europe, and September 20th in Australia. The game was a complete departure for the first two installments. Super Paper Mario was a side-scroller and played similarly to the Super Mario Brothers platformers. 
However, it still kept some RPG elements. For example, the player had health points that they had to keep track of. There were usable items to either heal or damage enemies. There was also a level up system that worked with the user's score instead of the usual star points, though it only increased the character's attack and health points. There were four playable characters, Mario, Peach, Bowser, and Luigi, each with a unique ability. Mario could shift between dimensions, Peach could float and shield herself with her parasol, Bowser could spit fire, and Luigi could do a super jump. One of Super Paper Mario's biggest innovations was the introduction of the Pixels. These little fairy-like creatures served as a substitute for the previous game's partner system. There were a total of 13 Pixels, with each of them having a unique ability. As an example, Tippy can uncover secret areas, Boomer could be used to explode cracked walls, Thudley gave the ability to ground pound, Pudge lets Mario and his companions use a hammer, and so on and so forth. The player would also have around Tippy, later on Tiptron, alongside another pixel of their choice. And of course, the biggest innovation being that you could switch dimensions. After getting the ability to go into 3D by Bestovius, this becomes the main gameplay mechanic. Something look like a dead end? Try going into 3D. See some unavoidable enemies? Go into 3D and they may be avoidable. The story revolves around Mario and his companions collecting the eight pure hearts to prevent the universe's destruction by Count Black. While the story was much darker for Mario's standards, it still had lots of funny dialogue and references to nerd culture and such. At release, Super Paper Mario was very controversial, with many fans upset with how big of a departure it was from the original two games. Even with all the controversy surrounding the game, there are lots of things pretty universally agreed upon, one of which is the soundtrack's quality. Intelligent Systems spared no expense to make the soundtrack, it seems, as a handful of songs are included in various Best Mario Songs rankings. Songs like The Ultimate Show and Gloam Valley are just a couple. The story is also considered to be the best, or at least one of the best, out of every Mario game. There is a lot, and I mean a lot, of lore in this game. In between each level is some text boxes that give more background to some of the game's main characters. There are also plenty of NPCs to talk to and get more insight. Also, here's a piece of trivia. Early PAL versions of the game contained a bug where if the language was set to English, German, or Spanish, and if Mario talked to the character Mimi in Chapter 2-2 without picking up a key, the game would freeze. As a response, Nintendo of Europe announced that they would switch affected copies with patched ones free of charge. Super Paper Mario was well received, reviewers praised the game's funny dialogue and more dark and mature story. The new gameplay changes were appreciated and thought of as well executed. The shifting from 2D to 3D in particular was found enjoyable to play with. However, the game was criticized for a lack of extra content as the game is beatable in about 20 hours. Nevertheless, Super Paper Mario still served as a great third-party entry to the series, and to many, it's the last good entry in the series. After Super Paper Mario's 2007 release, fans of the series would have to wait three years at E3 2010 to receive a trailer for the newest entry in the Paper Mario series. At the time, the game was only known as Paper Mario, and not much else was revealed, even at 2011's Nintendo World and E3. It was only at the following year's E3 that the game's full title was unveiled as Paper Mario Sticker Star, meant to release on the Nintendo 3DS during that year's holiday season. Sticker Star was the first game of the series to get a release on a handheld, but it was much more different than just that. The game's main new additions were the stickers, which were items scattered throughout the world and the player could use in battle. There were jump stickers with some unique ones which would allow Mario to jump on spiked enemies, or hammer stickers which gave the ability to cause an earthquake. Classic Mario items like the mushrooms and the fire flower were also made into stickers. Stickers had seven categories to choose from. Worn Out, which was the weakest, to Mega Flash, the strongest category. Stickers could also be used in the overworld to help Mario navigate and solve puzzles. Another type of sticker were the Things. These looked like everyday items and were not made out of paper, like a flashlight, a pair of scissors, or a fan, and were usable in battle to cause massive damage. The sticker system essentially replaced the partners and pixels from the previous games. The unique battle system had returned to the turn-based style of the first two games, but instead of badges and partners, Mario only used stickers to fight. Mario's health could only be increased when he found an HP up heart, which increased his health points by 5. There were no experience points, and the player's strength was solely dependent on the types of stickers they had in their possession. 
After each battle, the stickers that were used would disappear, which meant that the player always had to collect stickers. The game's visuals changed a bit, with the characters looking like paper cutouts in a 3D papercraft-like environment. All in all, Sticker Star took a very different approach compared to its predecessor in both looks, but most importantly, in terms of gameplay. Back in 2007, in the same Nintendo Power interview that was mentioned previously, regarding if the next entry was going to be similar to Super Paper Mario, director Ryota Kawade had stated that the company always feels that we want to challenge and to take on new things. Echoing his words, producer Kensuke Tanabe added, I also would like to look for another new and different style. In a series of interviews conducted by the late Satoru Iwata around the game revealed some interesting information concerning Sticker Star's development. Development for Sticker Star started in 2009, and an initial demo of the build presented at E3 2010 was shown to Shigeru Miyamoto. Reportedly, he wasn't impressed with it and thought the game looked like a port of the Thousand Year Door, and asked the team to change things up. The team behind the game was mostly composed of newer staff, around 90% of them. Due to Miyamoto's criticism, the team racked their brains to try and come up with something and ended up settling on stickers, which led them to abandoning some of the RPG elements like the partners and experience points. Miyamoto had also suggested to keep the story to a minimal and only use pre-established Mario characters. That decision was also supported by a Club Nintendo survey for Super Paper Mario, where less than 1% of the respondents considered the story one of its strong points. There exist some screenshots of early versions of the game with some noticeable differences compared to the final version. For example, health was initially represented by a yellow bar. There was a scrapped Monty Mole boss battle, battle spin used to be called battle chance, an unused Yoshi slash snake-like enemy, and various other minor differences like some item colors and sprites. The reception was much more harsh than the previous entries. While Sticker Star still received some positive reviews, Reviewers expressed their frustration regarding various aspects of the game. Many found the puzzles frustrating, that there was way too much backtracking, and that the story was lackluster and the sticker system wasn't well executed, especially since it replaced partners and badges. On the flip side, the dialogue and the humor of the game alongside its visual presentation were well appreciated. David Jenkins from the Metro UK summarized the frustration felt by fans best as he described the game as a horrible disappointment that not only fails to capture the magic of its predecessors, but seems oblivious to what made them popular in the first place. Two years after Sticker Star, Mario & Luigi Paper Jam released. While it was more of a Mario & Luigi game than a Paper Mario one, the gameplay of the Mario & Luigi series taking heavy inspiration from the original Paper Mario made the concept of this crossover interesting. Coincidentally, at this point, the two series had just came off releasing a fourth game that wasn't as well received as the original trilogy. In hindsight, Paper Jam showed the current state of both series and that they were kind of in the same situation of needing a game to gain their audience back. Both were criticized of being too gimmicky and not sticking to what made their game so beloved and expanding upon it. Mario & Luigi would go on to release two remakes before Alpha Dream eventually filed for bankruptcy while Paper Mario did the opposite, and looked to change the formula up even more. Funny to think about. The most recent game in the Paper Mario series was unveiled to all in a Nintendo Direct, which first aired live on March 3, 2016. The game was to be released on the Nintendo Wii U later that year. If stickers were the main gimmick of Sticker Star, painting was the one for Color Splash. To progress through the game, Mario used his hammer to paint and bring color back to colorless environments, such as enemies or parts of the environment. Battles were fought using battle cards, which needed to be painted on to increase their strength. After using the cards, they would disappear. But the player could always buy some in battle using the battle spin. There were three types of cards. Basic cards, which served to attack, heal, and restore paint. Things from Sticker Star made a return in the form of Thing cards. Finally, enemy cards allowed Mario to summon an enemy and use them as an ally. They would unfortunately run away when confronting bosses. Sometimes Kamek would appear and steal Mario's card, but they would be given back after the battle. The enemy's health is now shown as paint, decreasing as the enemy takes damage. To continue painting the overworld and battle cards, the player would have to manage their amount of paint and replenish by using basic cards or get paint as an enemy drop. Like in Sticker Star, HP up hearts are back, but this time increases Mario's health by 25. The paperization of the previous entry also returns to cut some parts of the courses, alongside the flip ability of Super Paper Mario, 
though it is limited to one course dedicated to Super Mario Bros. 3. One of the most unusual elements and concept arts for Color Splash are present within the game in the art gallery. Two locations were left unused. First was Decalburg from Sticker Star, which featured a path towards a part of town that wasn't seen before. The other is a location resembling a temple with blue torches with three levels to it connected by staircases. The interior is also visible in the art gallery. The mountains and the desert sand make it likely that it was an earlier version of the Kawano Temple present in the game. In an interview with Game Informer, some information was given regarding the conception of Color Splash. Kensuke Tanabe explained that the idea of repainting the world came from the director of production, Atsushi Ikuno. Ikuno said that seeing his children play with paint is what gave him the idea. Tanabe also said that the game's battle system was more focused on puzzle solving instead of the typical turn-based system, which is more combat-focused. Another interview, this time from US Gamer, interviewed co-producer Risa Tabata, who explained that the Wii U's gamepad allowed the card-based system to work better than it would have on the 3DS due to the gamepad screen being way bigger. Prior to release, the reception of Color Splash was not positive. Its similarities to Sticker Star had already put many on alert, and the new emphasis on paint was seen as another dumb gimmick like the stickers. There was even a Change.org petition to have it and Metroid Prime Federation Force cancelled. After release, however, the reviews were generally positive. The art style and soundtrack were praised as many thought the game looked really pretty. The dialogue and jokes were, as usual, well received. However, many disliked the lack of a leveling system, having to use the gamepad, and that the battle system was slow and too simplistic. The plot was also criticized, but especially the lack of character variety. Dan Rickard stated that there were too many toads. In a post-release interview with Game Informer, Tanabe addressed the lack of variety in characters by explaining that Miyamoto had once again asked them to stick to already established characters of the series. Nevertheless, Color Splash was still a good game, but it wasn't what fans wanted after Sicker Star. Following the release of Color Splash, Nintendo shifted their focus from the Paper Mario franchise to the release of their brand new console, the NX. As rumors regarding the NX increased, hype for the future of Nintendo grew exponentially. Amongst all this hype, a new promising console featuring a new revolutionary Zelda game and a gorgeous 3D Mario. The idea of Nintendo releasing a new Paper Mario game became less and less of a priority in the mind of the average Nintendo fan. This hype continued until spring of 2020 when Nintendo released Animal Crossing and went silent. Likely due to the pandemic, Nintendo provided no news on upcoming Nintendo games or any other plans for the future. Nintendo went completely silent for months, until one day, on May 14th, 2021, Nintendo spoke. Instead of announcing a date for a Direct like they previously would, Nintendo dropped a trailer for a new Paper Mario game out of nowhere. The people were excited to hear Nintendo releasing games again, and Paper Mario fans were excited for a new promising entry. The appearance of an evil Princess Peach and an origami cult made fans hopeful for another complex, story-rich game akin to the first few Paper Marios. While the story looked promising, many fans were turned off by the battle system, which once again strayed from the RPG battle system of PM64 and TTYD. Many fans needed to get their hands on the game to make a definitive statement on their opinions, and luckily, they didn't have to wait very long. On July 17, 2021, a mere two months after the game was announced, Paper Mario The Origami King released on the Nintendo Switch in the United States to an extremely toxic and diverse fan reception. Upon release, TOK was mainly received with either one of two opinions. You were either a diehard Paper Mario fan who believed that the new Paper Mario game should be like the old ones, or a newer fan who believed that both versions of the Paper Mario series are perfectly decent games in their own ways. For a while, it seemed like these two were the only two opinions anyone had on TOK. And if one member of one group opposed another, you'd witness a fight between Paper Mario fans like no other. The fan base was completely split, and became extremely toxic as a result. It was almost as if a conversation about Paper Mario couldn't happen without absolute chaos. This was a bad time for the Paper Mario community. However, as time passed, the game became less and less controversial. But why is that? Let's take a look at the game itself. It is very much more similar to the more recent Paper Mario games, being Sticker Star and Color Splash. It has no leveling system, few brand new character types, an obsession with paper, or in this case also origami, and a lack of real RPG elements. It takes place in the Mushroom Kingdom, as you'd expect, but this time parts of the world are just gone, and you need to throw confetti to fix it. Similar to painting pieces drained of their color in Color Splash. And like with the paint hammer from Color Splash, you can only have a certain amount of confetti before you run out. But it is incredibly easy to find. As for the plot, it's centered around the evil King Ollie, who wants to turn everything into origami. 
His sister Olivia is your main companion throughout the game. The bosses in the game are mostly the volumentals of different elements or office supplies. There really were not many brand new characters in this game, like with the previous two entries in the series. Partners were kind of brought back, but not in the same way as the original three. Partners are with you for a limited amount of time, and you don't have much control over them, unlike the original three games. They also don't have the more unique designs. There is Bobby, who looks like a regular bob -omb, without a fuse, and Spike, who is, well, a fairly normal-looking Spike. There are others as well, and you get the point. Overall, opinions on TOK are fairly split, with it having an 80% on Metacritic and a 7 out of 10 from IGN. The popular opinion was that this game is better than Color Splash and Sticker Star, but not as good as the original three. However, there is a sect of the fanbase that does think that this is the best game in the series. Now that all the games have been covered, it's time for some interesting pieces of trivia for each game. Paper Mario 64 In the Japanese version of Paper Mario, the gold Lil Oinks would drop jelly shrooms when leaving the farm. However, in the US version, they dropped Ultra Shrooms. This allows players to have an infinite source of Ultra Shrooms, while in the Japanese version, only five are obtainable in the entire game. In the Ice Palace chapter, there's a puzzle in which the players had to find the real bombette amongst a bunch of fakes. If Mario leaves the room and comes back by clipping through the wall and has Cooper as his partner, Cooper will kiss Mario after solving the puzzle instead of bombette. Doing this with any other partner will cause the game to crash. Bowser's final boss theme has a Japanese and US version. The latter one uses different instruments and is commonly regarded as the better version by fans. If the player waits 10 seconds after the jingle that plays to introduce a new chapter, a complete version of the Super Mario Bros. theme will start playing. Thousand Year Door At one point, the W emblem was purple instead of yellow. This implies that the emblem would change Mario's clothes to look like Waluigi instead of having to fuse both the L and the W emblem. In the Japanese version, Mario and his party are healed once Chapter 1 is complete. After every other chapter, they do not get healed. In the international version, Mario's party is healed after every chapter. The first battle against Lord Chump is impossible to lose. Even if Mario comes in with 1 HP, the game will increase his health to 5 and only allow him to jump or defend. Eddie the Mask's name is probably a reference to Eddie the Head the mascot of the group Iron Maiden. If the player looks through Professor Frankly's trash can after the fight with the Shadow Sirens, they can find Vivian's Tattle, but not Marilyn's or Beldum's. This is a subtle foreshadowing that Vivian would eventually join the party as only Tattles of one-time enemies can be found in the trash. Super Paper Mario Seth Gordon wanted to make a movie based on Super Paper Mario. However, he was never able to pitch the idea to Nintendo, so nothing came out of it. On the back cover of the game's guidebook appears a golden fuzzy, but there aren't any found inside the game. In the German version, Francis the Chameleon is called Conrad. This is a reference to Conrad, a popular German PC store. Near the end of the game, Dementio will ask the player if they want to join him to fight Count Black. If the player says yes four times, they get enslaved and are treated to a game over screen. Same goes for if you keep saying no to Merlin at the beginning of the game. When Dementio orders Fractail to self-destruct, the dragon says, I am Error, a reference to an NPC in Zelda 2. Sticker Star The file containing the scripts for Curtsy are called Navi. This could be a reference to Ocarina of Time's Navi as they both fulfill a similar role. The game contains the files for the Super Mario Bros. 3 enemy Patui, implying that they were originally planned to be in the game. It is the only game in the series that doesn't start in Mario's house. The house is never even seen, in fact. When using the Boombox sticker, a remix of the space theme of Super Mario Land 2, six golden coins plays. Color Splash On September 22, 2016, the game was accidentally made available to play for anyone who preloaded it two weeks before the planned release date. Despite Color being written Color in the UK and Australia, the titles of their copies of the game were not changed to reflect this. The seven main colors of the game, red, blue, yellow, violet, orange, green, and black, are the exact same used for Koopaling's magic wands all the way back in Super Mario Bros. 3. Since then, there hasn't been a new entry to the series. Many fans of Paper Mario feel as though the series was changed for the worst, with Sticker Star and Color Splash. Some would even go as far as to say that Super Paper Mario was the start of this decline. The partner system alongside the badges, two beloved features of the first two games, have yet to return since the Thousand Year Door. 
Not too long ago, fans of the series made the hashtag remaster TTYD trending worldwide on Twitter to express their desire for a return to this style of the game. The silver lining for them is that unlike Alpha Dream, Intelligent Systems is going strong, thanks in large part to the rebirth of the Fire Emblem franchise, ushered by Fire Emblem Awakening. Plus, since Color Splash only released around three years ago, there's reason to believe that a new Paper Mario installment is going to be announced for the Nintendo Switch. Until then, fans of the series can always look back to the games that they love so much and hope that the newest entry takes inspiration from them. Paper Mario has a very storied history, and we can only hope that the history continues with the new entry on the Switch. Until then, we can still go back to playing the original three Paper Mario games and hope that the mistakes from the recent entries will be fixed. We thank you for watching Unfolded, a Paper Mario documentary. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, like, join our Discord, and check out some of our other videos. We have plenty of Mario content on Game Domain, and think you'll enjoy it a lot. This has been Taylor with Game Domain. Attention, all game domain fans. We hope you enjoyed this video. Now, if you did, remember to subscribe to Game Domain, like this video, and then check out some of our other videos. Please join our Discord to chat with our staff and our other GD fans. Also, subscribe to Game Domain. Thank you.